generating electricity directly from the magnetic field cradling the fusion reaction at the center of the machine. Really? I have all kinds of questions about that. Like, today we are looking at a very heavily requested real engineering video. This one is called Nuclear Fusion is Changing, or a better way, or a new way to achieve nuclear fusion. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's check this out. The images you are seeing right now have been a closely guarded secret for years. This is the first time footage of this technology has been shared publicly. Really? A closely guarded secret? Helion is that much of a secret. Why do they have their own YouTube channel and why are they publishing their 2020 results? I think real engineering is just being a little bit more dramatic. A technology that has the potential to change the course of human history. A privilege Helion Energy granted us when we visited their facility. What I am sharing right now is going to be studied by nuclear physicists around the world, trying to reverse engineer the world changing machine. Then this why are they letting Trenta, you upload it? Helion's sixth generation <laughs> nuclear fusion generator. This fusion generator is unlike any other, using a completely novel approach to achieve nuclear fusion, adapting knowledge developed for ion propulsion in space. Okay. The generator forms two mirrored rings of plasma on either end of a reactor, the bow tie. and in a tenth of a thousandth of a second, they fire them at each other, tenth sequentially of activating powerful magnets to squeeze and compress the rings towards the center, where they collide, converting the astonishing kinetic cool energy looking. of the ions, traveling at 300 kilometers per second, into thermal energy, raising the plasma temperature to tens of millions of degrees hot enough to overcome the electromagnetic repulsion keeping the ions apart and allowing them to fuse. Now tens of millions of degrees, that sounds low to me. I mean that's comparable to that of the sun, the sun's 15 million degrees Celsius. When I think of magnetic confinement, the numbers I'm thinking of are in the hundreds of millions of degrees. Now it's not impossible to induce fusion at temperatures that low, it kind of depends what they're fusing but it's going to be a much less efficient process. You're, gonna, you're not going to produce nearly as much energy at a relatively lower temperature than you would as temperature goes up. So makes me wonder if this is going to work on a... So let's see how they're going to get around that. Forming new atoms and releasing a tremendous amount of energy in the process. This isn't the world of fairy tale. This is already happening. I watched so the dramatic. bright pink flash of fusion multiple times inside the control room of Trenta, safe away from the gigawatts of power surging through the capacitor banks of the reactor. It became mundane pretty quickly. Did he say multiple gigawatts? I mean, if it's a pulse, you can get into the gigawatt range because you're dividing by a really small number. Kind of like how pulse lasers work, how you can have megawatts as a laser tattoo remover. That's a lot different than generating gigawatt plus levels of power over the course of 18 to 24 months like a commercial nuclear fission plant. The fundamental concept of how these systems work is unlike most fusion. And here we inject a fusion target, we call this one a field reverse configuration, then using pulsed magnetic fields to very high pressures, we compress that fusion plasma up to fusion conditions. One of the challenging parts yeah. is how do you get that target, that initial fusion fuel into the compression chamber and do it in a repeatable, symmetric, um, uh, high energy way. And so one of the mm -hmm. things that we pioneered was a concept of merging field reverse configurations, merging these plasmas, where on, we actually have a symmetry on either side of the machine. We have in, these injectors, we call them the formation section. Interesting he said how new it was. I mean, he mentioned, so field reverse confinement fusion, that this isn't the first one. Now, it'll be interesting to see what he has that's different, but it's been in development since the 1950s just like a lot of other fusion projects have been in this uh, 
experimental stage for quite some time. I mean, the main advantage of this sort of thing compared to, say, a tokamak design is the geometry is easier to work with, with more compact magnetic geometry, so it's a lot more stable, presumably easier for the reactor operator to, to manage. And this is based on the concept of magnetic reconnection, where basically the magnetic fields break and then reconnect. So it creates a an energy balance allowing them to achieve that level of stability. That's one of the key things involving nuclear fusion is you have to maintain confinement for a long enough time in order to achieve ignition. But they still have a lot of the disadvantages that all fusion reactors have, like expensive materials, challenges achieving the net positive energy output, and this particular one, it looks tiny compared to, say, a tokamak. So it'd be interesting to see what they run into as they scale this thing up. They take all that kinetic energy that we put into them when we accelerated them, and they stop. They stagnate, converting that kinetic energy into temperature, into thermal energy, mm -hmm. and that starts the fusion reaction. We then can compress it all the way up to the full fusion conditions. Okay. Yeah, that's basically how fusion works. High temperature, high pressure, and confinement time. Uh, the actual plasma generation happens on this end, right? The plasma generation happens right here, interestingly enough. So over here, we're standing in front of what is called the diverter. This is what happens after the reaction. Interesting. Um, here is our formation section. Here is where we initially inject our neutral gas. So the gas is ejected from a flow manifold, a fuel manifold here, where we puff in gas in a neutral gas um, that's just at room temperature. This gas fills this chamber over the course of several thousandths of a second. Um, at this point, it's room temperature. It it's very low pressure, um, a fusion fuel mix of deuterium and helium-3. So deuterium and helium-3, that is less reactive than deuterium-tritium, which happens naturally in the sun and is more commonly used. So lower temperature and lower reactivity. How much power is this thing supposed to produce? How are they getting away with such low numbers? Because this, I can see how you get gigawatt pulses but <laughs> where is my uh, hundreds or thousands of sustained megawatts a version of, of of fusion fuel that 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 helion and very few others do but what that enables us to do is form a closed magnetic topology a closed plasma object that we can do things to we can actually do work on um, and so uh, at that point we now have a closed field reverse configuration in this formation section, we then start to pulse these magnetic field coils at high at high pressure. You notice here, the bolts, the pressure, everything goes up because here's where we really do the fusion. Yeah, you're gonna need a big pressure vessel for something like that, for a vessel capable of withstanding a lot of pressure. We're not saying how much pressure it is, interestingly enough. If we've done everything right, this FRC this, that we've injected into the main compression section has met its mate that we made symmetrically on the other side. And what they do is those two collide. Those two plasmas collide, and here's the really important part, they stop. They stagnate, they take all that kinetic energy we added, all that velocity, and we turn that into thermal energy. It superheats up, and if you've done everything right, in the middle of this, you have a system that's on the order of 10 to 20 million degrees sitting in this main compression that's section, low. ready to do fusion. So now you rapidly, as fast as modern technology will allow, <laughs> we increase the magnetic field to high pressure, compressing that fusion plasma all the way up to fusion conditions over 100 okay. million degrees. There, there's the 100 fusion million. Fusion starts, fusion begins, large amount of fusion is happening. So 100 million still sounds a little low. Not as low as 10 million, but usually 150 million, 200 million. There are some that are experiments that are even into the single digit of billions. Um, deuterium fusing together with helium-3 to form helium-4 and an extra hydrogen. And both of those two particles are very high temperature now. They're born inside the fusion plasma. Yeah, the electrons aren't going to be doing that. <laughs> you're, you're heated up to plasma state. You're going to have electron soup and nucleus soup, basically. Positive and negative charges. Applying pressure back on these magnetic fields. That works just like in a piston, where in a piston you compress the fusion, the, you compress the fuel, it begins to burn, it then gets hotter, it pushes back on that piston. It's a good analogy. All electromagnetically. This is a truly innovative concept. With tokamak reactors, like the massive ITER reactor being built in France right now, electricity is created by converting the kinetic energy of neutrons expelled during fusion to heat by slowing them down in the blanket walls. This heat is then transferred to high pressure water to create high pressure steam, 
which turns a turbine attached to an electric generator that rapidly rotates a magnetic field around copper wires. The same way that fission plants produce energy, the same way that coal and natural gas plants produce energy, this, this sort of concept has been around for centuries, making electricity from steam. ...generate an electric current. Helion is skipping steps one through four and going straight to moving a magnetic field around copper wires, generating electricity directly from the magnetic field, cradling the fusion reaction at the center of the machine. Really? I have all kinds of questions about that. Like, plasma is hot. How do you not melt the conductors? <laughs> also, it isn't known for its stability relative to creating nice, clean, alternating current in a sinusoidal and predictable manner. So what kind of electricity is this going to be? And is this even going to be usable by the grid operator? And safety concerns, ultra high energy ionizations, crazy temperatures, and those are just kind of the basic ones. I'm, I wonder how efficient this process would be when you got something at millions of degrees going on the order of ambient wire temperatures. Huh. The fusion reaction occurs. The energy it generates begins to push back on the magnetic field confining it, moving it. As David said, like a piston. It's this changing magnetic field that will generate Helion's electricity. Skipping all the initial steps needed to boil water and turn it- I mean, I appreciate the innovation behind using centuries-old steam turbine technology, but I'd really like to have those questions answered. <laughs> ...should, in theory, make it vastly theory. more efficient, while also unlocking the major benefits of a superior nuclear fusion fuel mixture. One of the problems with tokamak reactors is their choice of fuels. The fuel mixture of choice for tokamaks is deuterium and tritium. The availability of deuterium is not a problem. It's everywhere. This is a bottle of heavy water. Water with two deuterium atoms instead of two regular hydrogen atoms. Cheap and safe. I can even drink it. However, tritium, as we spoke about in- Relatively cheap, not as cheap as a bottle of water. I want to say I'm not up to date on current commodities pricing, but I think a bottle of water is going to be on the order of, of a few hundred bucks of, of heavy water. So relatively cheap, but I wouldn't drink too much of the stuff because of its higher density and it may adversely affect uh, some of your internal systems just dealing with that extra water load, but you can drink a little bit of it and be fine. Just don't drink gallons of the stuff. Detail in our last video is extremely rare. We only have about 20 kilograms of it in global reserves and a single commercial scale tokamak is expected to burn through 300 grams of it a day. If you want to see my reaction to uh, Real Engineering's video on Tokamax, I think he titled it The Problem with Nuclear Fusion, I'll pin it down below and I go into more detail about some of those challenges. But the short version on that is we haven't needed that much of it, so we haven't had the need to produce it. It's kind of like in 1945, almost the entire world supply of uranium-235 was used for the little boy weapon. Note that the fat man used plutonium as its main active ingredient. But now we got a whole bunch of uranium-235 that we use for nuclear power plant. Bit of a chicken and egg sort of thing. But I get what he means about not using tritium. However, these deuterium-helium reactions, and maybe that's actually why they called this company Helion, is because they're using helium-3 instead of tritium. The big problem, though, is tr the deuterium-tritium reaction releases so much more energy. So with helium, we're talking about 100 million degrees. So that's 10 to the minus 1 billion kelvins on this graph. We're talking almost two orders of magnitude difference so 100-ish times less power. You'll also see on this graph that the deuterium-helium-3 reaction gets a lot more. You just need to make the thing more hotter. More hotter. Technical term, maybe. In order for the deuterium-helium-3 reaction to just give you that much more energy. That's about two months of operation with the world's entire current supply. Tokamak generators will manufacture tritium on site using a lithium breeding layer. When the high energy neutrons from our nuclear fusion reaction collide with the lithium in the reactor wall, the lithium splits into tritium and helium. This is a reasonable solution, but 80% of the energy of the tritium cool to tritium fusion reaction 
is carried by those high energy neutrons. So those electrons still crack me up. Effectively wasted all of our energy to get back to square one. To combat this, the first layer of tokamak walls will be made of beryllium, a neutron multiplier, which creates two neutrons when struck by one neutron, giving us one neutron to create tritium and one neutron to generate heat. However, beryllium is extremely expensive. The entire annual global supply is just enough to build a single tokamak generator. Beryllium also contains uranium impurities, which will be encountering the high energy neutrons too, making the beryllium blanket dangerously radioactive over time. I could just make a little fusion fission hybrid. No, just purify the beryllium. That's how you get around that. I mean, that's not insurmountable compared to the other challenges of fusion, like, again, producing more energy than, you, than it costs. Which will make disposing of it expensive. This all points to one massive problem. Tokamak reactors are going to face the exact same issues as nuclear fission energy. They will be too expensive and won't be able to compete with cheaper forms of electricity. Yeah, I talked about that a lot more in a different video. I'm just gonna add it to the pinned comment down below and say that statement is wrong for a whole mess of reasons. The first, the first one being the cost difference between technology that we know works and we know works very well versus something that doesn't exist yet of comparing fission to fusion and renewables being a quick short term solution, but ultimately have a lot of disadvantages compared to nuclear in terms of reliability. This is why Helion is using a completely different fuel mixture. So Helion's approach to fusion use a deuterium and a helium-3 fuel. Deuterium is really common. It's part one part in 500. I don't get what's so novel about a lot of this design. I haven't... The only thing I heard that was weird and new was the direct conversion of the plasma to electricity, which I wonder if they've tried that aspect. Have they tried to just even turn on a few light bulbs with it? But everything else, like using deuterium and helium, it's not... It's not unique. All water, it's in the coffee you drink, um, and safe and, 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 and readily abundant and low cost as well. We buy it in uh, compressed gas cylinders that's already purified, but you could imagine doing the purification yourself. It's pretty straightforward. The helium-3, however, is ultra rare. Um, and in fact, while helium-3 was theorized in the early days of fusion as being the best fusion fuel because of its rarity, there haven't been a lot of approaches that have used helium-3 or demonstrated helium-3. To our knowledge, Trento was the first system. Interesting him talking about rarity, so similar problems with the whole with tritium. I actually don't know off the top of my head which is more rare, but it's kind of... The big thing is just the energy difference. That seems like the bigger issue to me. ...about that did bulk helium, deuterium helium-3 fusion for a power generation application. One thing Helion has done is we patented a helium-3 process of creating helium-3, of taking two deuteriums found commonly in nature and at high pressure in a fusion system, ironically, fusing them together to form helium-3, taking one more deuterium, fusing that with the helium-3 to make helium-4, and that make, that's what makes the electricity. I mean, that's, that's a good idea to have basically, you know, making your own stuff on site i know so much simpler example a lot of the reactor grade water at the nuclear plant that i worked at it has to have an exceptional amount of purity using being heavily demineralized so the whole demineralization system that comes just from well water we basically have that water purification plant on site that supplies the uh, reactor as well as all of its support systems with the high purity water that it needs. So this aspect makes sense if you're going to use something that is typically hard to come by. Making it on site does, does make sense in certain situations. Now not every commercial nuclear power plant has that. A lot of that just kind of depends on where it's located. So it's only the reaction of the de deuterium with helium-3 that generates the the deuterium with the deuterium generates some amount of electricity, a small amount. It generates about um, one eighth of the of the deuterium helium three reaction. And deuterium helium three generates on the order of one hundredth. Interesting. So if we go back to this graph, deuterium deuterium actually produces a bit more 
at your low 100 million degree temperature. Now you bring it, you bring it up more into, well, what is that intersection point? 300, 400 million, something like that. At that point is when deuterium helium three actually scales more. But no, if you're using deuterium deuterium at, at, a, at a low temperature, you're actually making more energy. What influences that? So it influences the amount of power output per reaction is, is the actual atomic physics that's happening, where when two deuteriums combine, um, they, they have a, a few reactions, but the one we care about most uh, will create a, a helium-3. And that, that helium-3 will have a lower mass deficit, so the amount of, of missing mass um, of that, that final product. So E equals mc squared, and that mass deficit is the amount of energy that's released in terms of the particles that are created and their temperatures. And so so deuterium helium-3 has a larger mass deficit when it forms helium-4, and so you end up with more um, energy trapped in that, that, that helium-4 as well as in the other proton that is made. Again, temperature matters a lot in fusion. He kind of he kind of glossed over that a bit. One interesting thing, so he mentions of uh, the E equals M C squared. I mean that that is one similarity that uh, fusion has to fission is it's real really the delta M C squared. The change in mass energy is what the energy, the heat that actually comes from these nuclear reactions that we are using to generate electricity. Whether you do it with fission or fusion, it's pretty cool. Pure MC squared would involve completely annihilating the reactants in the case of a matter-antimatter reaction. Now, if you thought fusion was expensive, it still is, but antimatter is even more expensive. There's quite a lot to break down there. As David said, the energy released depends on the mass difference in the final reaction. But how we can capture that energy changes with the products that are created too. Two types of fusion can occur when fusing two deuterium atoms. One creates a helium-3 atom and a neutron. Most of the energy of that fusion event is carried away by that neutron. Tokamak reactors generate electricity by converting the kinetic energy of neutrons to heat in their walls. But helion's energy capture system can't generate electricity with neutrons because they have no charge. Helion needs charged right. particles to push back against the magnetic confinement to generate electricity. That neutron just flies right through the magnetic jail. The helium-3, however, carries about 0.82 mega electron volts of useful energy that the generator can capture. In a second possible reaction, deuteriums can create a proton and a tritium, with the proton carrying 3.2 mega electron volts of energy and the tritium isotope carrying 1.01. So here's the challenge. I'm not sure, again, what this plasma generator efficiency is of converting that to electricity. I do know that it is not 100%, but here we're talking each individual reaction, okay, less than a mega electron volt, a bit more. Each uranium-235 fission generates 200 mega electron volts, and the efficiency for a steam turbine is about 33%. It can vary a bit. Most steam cycles use uh, moisture separator reheaters in order to split the steam out to optimize the thermal efficiency of the steam cycle. You'll, you'll never see a plant at scale that does not have something like that because each individual percentage point is worth many millions of dollars over time, <laughs> that it's well worth the uh, increased capital cost of buying feed water heaters and moisture separator reheaters. I don't know, this, this whole process doesn't seem very efficient because you're getting less per reaction and they haven't said what their efficiency of this uh, plasma electricity extraction is yet. But even if it was 100, you're still dealing with energies on the order of 200 times less per reaction. Or, or it'd be 200 times less per reaction. So divided by three, that would be um, 60 something times less. Not looking very good. This generator will capture as much energy as possible from these particles before exhausting them through the turbo molecular pump in the diverter section. Turbo the molecular pump. An electron Sounds cool. Becoming hydrogen and the radioactive tritium being transferred to remote storage. Proteum. Technically right, but never heard anyone call hydrogen one proteum. Here, it will beta decay into helium three, but this process takes 12.3 years to occur. When it finally does decay, that helium-3 can be fed back into our generator. 
So Helion has two pathways to create Helium-3 for their primary fusion energy reaction. When deuterium and helium-3 combine, they create a helium-4 atom and a proton, releasing 18.3 mega electron volts, more than the 17.6 mega electron volts released from deuterium and tritium reactions, and on a mass basis, four times more than a uranium fission reaction. So they're multiplying it through, take into account how much more massive the uranium is. That's true. A, di a different way of looking at things, but true. Now, does it make more? Well, you're going to have to increase your temperature. <laughs> Generate your fuel right where you need it is a huge advantage. But David Kirtley had an interesting alternative. Um, it's a very good business case of you could do it that way, or you could do it where you have one dedicated facility and all it does is fuse deuterium and make fuel and then put it in a bottle, separate it from all the other, the other gases, and then ship that to your generators and have the generators just make electricity and not deal with the fuel processing. Um, I think that's a good outstanding business decision that we, we don't know. Um, one of the things that you have to keep in mind is when you do the deuterium fusion, that's when you make the neutrons. So the neutrons come from the deuterium, deuterium fusing together. Um, and so there's some really maybe advantageous things of separating those two machines. One thing they have not talked about yet was the neut was neutron shielding because neutrons are still being produced in these reactors and neutron is very high dose for a given amount of energy it's about five to 20 times worse as f what it would do to the human body depending on the energy level of the neutrons and in this case they would be pretty high so probably towards the upper end of that considering the temperatures are so much higher than anything you would see in a, in a fission reactor now i can understand for this little small experiment of uns specified power output but if this thing's going to get scaled up multi hundred megawatts or thousands of megawatt of reactor you're going to need some shielding because it's going to be producing that many neutrons you're, you can't have plant operators walk right next to this thing now this isn't a waste concern these neutrons are going to be when the reactor is operating and the neutrons will just slow down or get absorbed by something usually in concrete Hydrogenous, uh, densely packed material such as concrete is what's used for uh, protection against neutrons. That's where the shield walls, and keep in mind in a commercial fission nuclear power plant, there are three walls. One being around the actual reactor vessel, two being around the reactor coolant system. That's also known as the bio wall where you're not going to send any people in while the reactor is operating because the dose rates are too high. And the third being the reactor containment building. I think these guys are pretty early and they haven't built anything at scale yet, but those are some challenges they're going to need to consider. One of those advantages is prolonging the life of our generator. The high energy neutrons from the deuterium-deuterium reaction can damage our generator. This is a huge problem for tokamak generators because 80% of the energy in the deuterium-tritium reaction is carried by the neutron. But the neutron generated when two deuterium atoms fuse has five times less energy, reducing the damage it can do. However, they are- Thermal neutrons can still cause embrittlement or activation of things in the field. And thermal neutrons, we're talking well below a, well below a kilo electron volt, let alone mega electron volt. So still, that's, it's still gonna be a concern. Damaging. If we could design a cheaper, more robust reactor purely to create our fuel products, that could be economically beneficial, especially if there are multiple generators that all need fuel supplies. Replacing one fuel generator that can feed 10 energy generators is a lot cheaper than replacing 10 hybrid fuel and energy generators. So there are many benefits from moving away from deuterium and tritium, but the deuterium and helium-3 reaction does require higher temperatures. Yes. And this does pose an engineering challenge, especially as Helium progresses to their commercial scale reactor. So right now we're building Polaris, their seventh generation system. Uh, the goal is that it will demonstrate electricity production for the first time, um, come online in 2024.
the, the stepping stone between our seventh generation system, we're building Polaris, and the eighth generation system is a lot of the... No way. I mean, I know it's 2024 now, but no way. Those neutrons, you're going to have cl to clear just the regulatory hurdles alone for building something at scale is going to take a few years. I'm sorry. I, I know it sounds like I'm poo-pooing this idea. I'm really not. I... I want it to succeed. I want to see nuclear fusion, but that that goal just is not realistic. I'm sorry, it's just not. I wish it was, but it's not. Bring around the system that we want to turn up the power output, the yield even further. We want to make sure we're taking that the electricity that we're recharging capacitors with, turning that into 60 hertz AC and putting that on, on the grid. And then also repetition rate. That's a big one. That's a big if. That's the electrical equivalent of your crazy plasma thing that's going at, um, of having your race car going 250 miles per hour and then having it immediately turn into your driveway and stop. It's actually harder than that, but that's, that's kind of what I thought of, my initial thought. Going from operating every few seconds to now operating multiple times a second is another engineering jump leap we have to make in some of the, the thermal engineering, structural engineering, and gas handling systems. What do you think is gonna be the, the biggest challenge in making that jump. I think any if you ask any engineer or scientist on my team, you're actually going to hear a different answer for what is the hardest thing that we're trying to solve. Um, yeah, that sounds it. That just means there's a lot of challenges. <laughs> that is exactly what that means. And I I totally understand that that mentality. My personal belief in, in building the steady operating systems that we built in the past is it comes into the thermal operation of these systems, where as things start to heat up, they change. The structural mechanics change. Oh, yeah. Magnets. Uh, the way the, the fusion plasma actually, actually the wall temperature changes as it changes in temperature. We saw that on our earlier subscale systems, and so we expect to see that on the big scale systems too. And so understanding that, predicting that, and then engineering all the mechanisms in, in place for that, I think are going to be some of the most exciting engineering challenges that we're solving right now. Um, and so we're hiring those teams to, 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 to solve those problems right now. Were there any surprising learning moments recently that you've discovered with Trenta? There were some exciting things that we learned on Trenta that were unexpected. We were really worried early that the timing accuracies of merging these two high-speed plasmas over a million miles and compressing them, working on getting their alignment, um, that that would be really a tough challenge. And what we found that is in practice is actually quite a bit easier than the theory or the basic computation com simulations would actually show, that we can with a lot of uh, essentially um, freedom merge these and get really good results that are really repeatable. Some of the things we did find, however, that are a little bit more challenging is as these plasmas got hotter and we got above 10 million degrees and got to the 100 million degrees, um, what we found is that there's probably some other effects, good effects, where we're producing more fusion than we may be predicted, but the fusion plasma um, interacts with... That might be why they're working with such low temperatures. They're a bit hesitant to turn that up. The ch vacuum chamber a little bit more than what we thought as well. And so what we're having to do for future systems is build them just a little bit bigger, about 25% bigger than what we'd originally planned. 25% is a lot. <laughs> and so there's some engineering iteration that has to happen as we discover the, the advanced physics and, and the engineering of implementing these systems in practice. This is another one of the benefits of Helion system. It's a much smaller generator than other generators like Eater's Tokamak, which makes it- They just said they had to build it bigger. <laughs> it's an advantage, but it doesn't work unless you build it well. <laughs> That's funny. ...far easier, as larger machines will be more expensive to build, making the capital cost of learning a much larger barrier. Polaris is their seventh generation system, and it's 25% bigger precisely because of the lessons learned from Trenta. The physics of fusion is a new frontier. There are few textbooks to learn from. Helion is helping write the first textbooks. I know what he means, but as far as the technology and the theory, it's none of it's even remotely new. But the weird thing to me is, is about the generator more so than the actual fusion part. He's just using a less common fuel because it's because it's just not as energy dense. I mean, try putting regular unleaded in a fighter jet and see how it works. And one of the things they discovered is that gyro orbits are larger than they expected. A gyro orbit is essentially the radius at which those fuel ions orbit around magnetic field lines. It's affected by the temperature, and thus the speed of the ions, and the magnetic field strength. Helion discovered with Trenta that these orbits are larger than simulations calculated, which meant the ions could impact the generator walls, 
and given their temperatures, oh. this was a no-go. So, Polaris is 20... Yeah. Yeah. Remember when I said that about nice, stable, clean AC power? Yeah. 5% <laughs> larger to account for this discovery. Sure. Polaris will also be the first generation to begin capturing electricity, but that's a lot easier said than done, and will need the very latest electronics to work quickly enough. Under yeah, Trenton, be fast. there are stacks upon stacks of capacitor banks. 90% of Trenton's power goes towards generating the huge currents needed to generate its magnetic fields. Wow. The magnets that form and push the plasma forward run at 100,000 amps, while the main compression coils at the center of the machine run at 1 million amps. That's a lot. Main generator at a nuclear power plant, we're talking on the order of single digit thousand. Drawing that kind of current from the grid is impossible. Yeah. <laughs> so, Trenton needs a way to store power locally and discharge it quickly to achieve the necessary current. Batteries can't discharge that quickly, so Helion is relying on capacitor banks. Yeah. We took a look beneath Trenta to learn more about them. So what you're seeing here, this is actually one capacitor unit. Um, and so if you're used to other electronics, a, a capacitor... Each of these boxes is one unit? Each of those boxes is, is one capacitor that has several kilojoules worth of energy storage in it. That's big. Most capacitors can fit in your hand. <laughs> and capacitors, yeah, he's right. Capacitors do discharge a lot faster than, than batteries do. And we have hundreds of those capacitors that all in parallel, in a modular way, make the main bank. With the size of this capacitor bank, you would think it holds an astounding amount of energy. But the total capacity of the bank is just 10 million joules, the equivalent energy of about 22 bananas. Or, in terms of a typical Tesla battery pack, that's 2.8 kilowatt hours, 1 30th the capacity of a typical Tesla battery. However, we aren't expending that energy in an hour. We are releasing it in 100 microseconds. These capacitors release I mean, that's why you'd use a capacitor. It's not really for high, high capacity energy storage. It's all about fast response compared to, say, battery banks, which which are designed to last you on on the order of several hours. Think of these as an extremely fast version of an uninterruptible power supply. Lightning bolt of current through the machine. Gigawatts of instantaneous power. But it isn't an uncontrolled burst of electricity like a lightning bolt. It's a carefully controlled orchestra it's not of nearly switches, as much energy releasing <laughs> and controlling this much electricity with a microsecond precision simply was not possible when the concept was first envisioned. Within those 100 microseconds, thousands of operations occur across the machine. Each row of electromagnets along the machine need to activate 300 nanoseconds after the previous. They need to trigger just as the plasma passes by, Keep them insane. traveling at millions of kilometers per hour, to push it even faster towards the center. That would be impossible without modern day microprocessors and fiber optics. The sequence of events to cause fusion in this machine is a delicate symphony of electronics, pushing two plasma rings into a violent collision and catching that collision in a magnetic trap in the center, which proceeds to shrink until the ions trapped within it have nowhere else to go. Some fun animation there. Overcoming one of the universe's strongest forces to create new elements in the belly of a man-made machine. But Helion isn't done. They no. are already <laughs> building the next step in their quest for clean, safe energy for humankind with their seventh generation. Based on what this video has shown, they're just as far away as anybody else is. I mean, there's... And they haven't even talked about... Gene, ...which will do everything Trenta can do, but faster, and add another process, capturing the energy of the expanding plasma to generate electricity, adding even more complexity to the delicate symphony, with yeah. the energy flowing back and forth from capacitor banks like the tides on a shore. And hopefully, if all goes according to plan, each turning of the tides will push a world-changing electricity source onto our grids. I have never been particularly hopeful that nuclear fusion power was ever feasible, but speaking with David and all of the talented staff at Helion, and the recent news from the US Department of Energy about their net energy output from their inertial confinement reactor, it has really made me feel that this technology may not just be possible, but potentially around the corner. 
Uh, I don't know. As much as I'd like for that to be true, there's still a there's still a long ways for it to go, and I'm still in the 20 year plus category. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be this this negative about it. I want to see fusion to happen, but based on what this shown, it's they haven't even gotten into the operational challenges of this. They're still in they're still doing science experiments. When I say fusion 20 years away, it might be 20 years away from doing science experiments and building things at scale. And the process of building things at scale, getting all the necessary approvals, new technology, pioneering costs, it's... I don't think it'll never happen. I'm not one of those people. This hasn't even really shown me anything that different. And again, the whole neutron aspect, it they're definitely gonna... There's no way they can get around having having shielding or building any of those for any of their facilities. And I know this is a relatively small company. Have they even looked at that yet? I'm, I'm not sure because they haven't really done anything at scale. They haven't said how much power this thing is producing. We don't know the ratio of how much it costs versus how much it, it put in. It put in so and again the direct plasma generator so one thing i didn't mention earlier is that it's going to be emitting radiation it's going to be emitting x-rays as just from the extreme temperature the bremsstrahlung the breaking radiation because well you're having something in extreme motion extreme temperatures that doesn't really want to be that way for long and as it slows down as it constantly wants to it's going to be emitting some x-rays so yeah a radiological hazard in the secondary the non-nuclear part of the plant so basically we're going to have the generator within the nuclear part that yeah <laughs> i'm pretty sure the nrc would like to know about this. I wish this firm the best, just like any other nuclear fusion firm, and I'm just really not sure about this one. It seems to have even more challenges than the tokamak. But what are your thoughts? Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.